The theme is uh, very topical. It echoes in so many ways what has been discussed already, starting from the, I guess I'm audible, no? Uh, what we've been discussing from, uh, from early on, from Monday, from, from, from the morning, uh, those who had the pleasure to be at the lunch where Farid Zakaria addressed the audience as well, the themes that have been raised by him uh, in so many ways related to what we will be discussing at the panel. So I'm, I'm pleased that we have the swift continuation of the themes that you've been engaged already in, members of this panel as well. I'll give a bit of the rules of the game, so to say, for all of us to have. We have the pleasure of having extremely interesting, uh, very experienced, very diverse panel, at the same time posing a challenge of managing the time. <laughs> we are too many of us, and I don't count, obviously, myself as a participant of the discussion. I'll try not to steal too much time from my own side, not to give too uh, long of an introduction, uh, for you to have the benefit of listening out to our speakers who bring with them wealth of an experience and diversity of that experience from different corners of the world. And uh, while we don't have any representative from the country like the United States today at the panel, or China for that matter, I'm sure that many of you will not only be able but willing to touch some of the aspects that relates with the way how impact of the changing policies in the US that be or the positioning of China vis-a-vis -vis, uh, globalization and international discourse of the political developments as well are taking place. With that very, very short introduction from my side, what we will try to do today at the panel is to talk perhaps more on the driving forces and to have a bit of a forward-looking outlook in that regard as well of what we mean when we speak about, if not the end of globalization, uh, era of globalization, which myself personally I don't believe that we are at, but as economists called recently, globalization, if I'm correct with the term. It's clear that the golden era of globalization is somewhat over, at least for the foreseeable future, but where are we at? Is it a retreat? How temporal it is? Is it an irreversible process or not? But even more so, what are the driving forces that has led to this vivid uh, amplification uh, of the root causes, I would say, of what we are facing right now in 2016 with Brexit and then the results of the election in the US. Um, I don't believe that the process of slowing down of that golden era of globalization has started in 2016. We've seen elements of that already in 2008 and 9 when the financial crisis hit, but in 2016 it became evident. It became as clear as that it was impossible not to notice it's already as a deep problem that we might be, have been facing. And at the same time, just very short remark that I wanted to highlight is that it seems to me that frequently we were taking globalization almost as a force of nature of some kind, unstoppable, inevitable, natural in its own way, and as if it was not political decision in so many ways taken in different times. Uh, allowing for the institutions and tools to develop instruments that would help global trade, global movement of workforce, uh, access to capital and finance to take place, uh, and allowing for the businesses to develop the business models that enabled globalization to flourish, and then to develop the economies and the growth of economies of the kind that we've seen for the last past three decades for that matter. We've talked today already in different panels about growing gap in terms of distribution of wealth, how that resonates what we see now with the processes of slowing down of globalization and how inherent within the societies of uh, communities in West, and but not only, we would believe that it is now, and in that regard, how that feeds into the political momentum of populism that be, or more of the protectionism that we see at trade wars and even tech wars that are developing now as we see in the data world as well around the globe. I'll stop at that myself, and I uh, will not be following strictly the list that we have for the panel, but we'll be switching from time to time, but we'll address the speaker so that you would be free to address the issue as you've planned, but then with some flavor that might be interesting, in my opinion, as well, for you to add, perhaps, to that. 
We would appreciate it if you would have a first introduction no longer than five minutes, I would say, so that we have some follow-up or summative uh, second, um, either questions, follow-up questions, or comments from your side that the time would allow. I would have hoped that there would have been more time for the audience to be engaged, but if there will be interest and if the speakers will be okay, we might have some chance of having not comments, but then perhaps questions and engagement like that that could come from the audience. I would certainly myself will be very open to that, but let's see how it flows and then we'll see how we could follow on that. I will start with Mr. Marek Belka, Prime Minister of Poland in 2004 and 5. This is an era in which Poland joined EU. It has been a lot of effort, obviously, that was put in this direction. Uh, we now see how how beneficial for not only for the security and stability it was for Poland, but for economic growth as well. Uh, I live and work now in Ukraine, and I frequently hear how Ukraine and Polish economic development is compared from where it was uh, at the dissolution of the Soviet Union and where it is now. So how would you describe from your perspective the benefits of the new member of the European Union joining that... Uh, that framework of openness of borders, trade, movement of uh, human uh, work uh, for, for the country like Poland, and then being part of the globalization right after the dissolution of the space where Poland has been constrained involuntarily, I would say. So please, the floor is yours. Uh, well, thank you. I wouldn't like to concentrate on Poland. I will uh, take this issue out, uh, basically saying that uh, Poland has gained enormously by linking to the uh, European economy at large. And, uh, well, I have even sometimes heard some um, vitriolic comments about Poland, that Poland in the European Union is like a small China, uh, basically sucking jobs and uh, benefits from, from uh, the uh, m more mature um, economies. And now let's turn to, uh, to globalization as a, as a phenomenon. I don't think that uh, globalization is a product of anybody's decision. It's, um, it's organic in a sense that uh, it reflects the interests and the development, the technological development of the uh, of the planet, of the of the of the country, of the countries, of the of the world. Um, the question is: the, Do we do we witness an end of globalization? Of that, that's nonsense. How can we? Because uh, you know we cannot shut out internet. We cannot shut out uh, uh, international com uh, information technologies. Uh, we cannot uh, forbid international. Uh, value added chains. This is all uh, what is constituting the, uh, the environment for, for globalization. The problem with globalization is that it benefits uh, different countries in different way. You don't, uh, listen, you don't hear complaints about globalization from China or from India. Uh, well, with one qualification that I will turn to, but you uh, hear complaints and serious complaints in developed countries, and we know why, because uh, globalization has changed the relative prices, I'm an economist, the relative prices of factors of production. With uh, China and other Asian countries introducing one billion um, workers to the global economy, the price of labor, went down, and who is going to suffer, of course, the, the people in, uh, in advanced economies. But what is really a problem that, uh, that concerns uh, many is the financial globalization. Financial globalization has brought many benefits on, 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 on the world, on the countries. However, we have realized that the uh, financial sector grew out of proportion. It is like this uh, proverbial um, tail that is wagging the, do the dog. Uh, it is dominating the real sector. And uh, the character of financial sector, as we know, is that it is volatile, that is de destabilizing, that capital flows in, in masses, and then stops or flows out. 
basically harming the, 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 the emerging country. So, the problem is, what to do with financial globalization? Can we stop it, slow it down? Well, we probably could and we should, like introducing, for example, this famous Tobin tax. The problem, however, is that whenever we try to, uh, to tackle the issues of sustainable development, then we have to rely on global financial flows. Public money is not enough. Public money is less than 10% of what is flowing into uh, de developing countries to emerging markets that is even financing uh, global commons. So we have to sustain it. The problem is how to make the financial, the global financial system work for all. And this is another issue. If we are interested, I will come back to it in the next round. Thank you. Uh, let's continue with you. What do you make of the statement that we've heard now that it's, it's, it's a process that had its own life and will have its own life without the framework in which one could encourage, discourage, or put the brackets on it? Uh, we see that what is happening now in terms of anything that is happening to globalization is against the backdrop of shifting geopolit geopolitical scenario as well. And that reflects, obviously, on investment decisions that big multinational companies do make, geopolitical risks or unpredictability of the rules with which they have to operate in different countries or the regions are the factors they started to take into account. We see that vis-a-vis -vis Russia because of the sanctions. We see that still contemplated uh, with the potential of the trade war, perhaps with uh, China and then the US, to name but few. So how much all of that needs to be put against the backdrop of this shifting tectonic changes, as many call in geopolitics as well, where there is no view as of now that many would share that there will be any hegemony of any power anymore maintained, but a multipolarism of the kind in which the same degree of predictability of the rules might not be the case if there is no effort put into it by political elites to ensure that instruments and tools and frameworks are at place that are respected for trade, for financial uh, capital, accessibility, and movement of the people obviously to take place as well. Uh, thank you. <clears throat> so I'm a true witness of globalization. Half of my lifetime I was living in communist, isolated, small country and half of my lifetime now I'm living in a democracy uh, and I would never forget what it was back in uh, 1989 when the Berlin Wall fall and we started our way um, from totally isolated, poor, uh, a small country uh, to a member of the European Union, NATO. I saw how everything changed for positive. I saw how today my country, Bulgaria, has a six times bigger GDP, a 10 times bigger purchasing power per person, five times more money for healthcare, four times more money for education, three and a half times more money for pensions, and that is all in a period as a part of the process of integrating yourself with the progressive world where on one side nobody is waiting for you, globalization is a fact, it happens, and it will continue to shape our, uh, our lives. I also saw, by the way, I'm a computer engineer from education, even being then a minister and a head of state, um, and I remember very well, exactly also 30 years ago, as the Berlin Wall was falling, also WWW came to life with the first information exchange on the internet, and that changed our lives even more than the fall of the wall. So today, I look at my children and just tell me that globalization is not happening and it's not working. He is playing computer games in, with somebody in Brazil. Uh, the other one is looking at his own TV produced by some blogger uh, in the United Kingdom. The third one, I have four sons, is learning English 
out of YouTube uh, blogger of someone sitting in Africa. And it's really exciting to see how things are interconnected and how we embrace this new opportunity. But on the other side, you're saying, okay, well, look at Brexit, for example. Isn't that a symbol of something that we should call a new trend? Uh, or look at what the American president is doing, the President Trump. Or even look at, for example, we all speak a lot in the European Union about the Prime Minister Orban, who wants to stop migration, who is saying, I don't want to have a single mosque and a single Muslim in my country. And if you go in a detail of actually what happens, first of all, let me be very clear. For example, the Prime Minister Orban is fighting for every single foreign investment in his country in an extremely efficient way. So you can call him nationalistic or populistic, but he is fighting for foreign investments, paying hundreds of millions, for example, for BMW now moving their new production facility from Oxford to, uh, to Hungary, or uh, cooperating with GE in any possible way to attract foreign investments. Or, for example, look at the Brexiters. They're saying, OK, uh, we want to control our country and our territory, but they're bringing Singapore as a kind of a vision or a future. And I'm just asking myself, fine, but is that really the model for the United Kingdom? But definitely, Singapore is a very open economy and totally globalized economy. So I would say that it is obvious to me that from economic perspective, from cultural perspective, from industries, from tourism to life sciences, the growing new industrial revolution that is linked to customizing all the products, there is no way to stop it. And it will continue to be a global trend. Politically, for example, the American president is saying, I want to raise trade barriers. I want to put protectionist measurements. But just look, is it possible even for the president of the United States to stop Google or to stop Apple or to fight against their long-term globalized culture, tradition, and products? So everything is globalizing. Products, uh, production lines, production uh, networks, and this will continue to be like that. And again, I want to make the difference between the pure political action, speaking, and things that happen on the ground. For example, China, that has, as a part of its globalization, moved hundreds of millions out of poverty, became a global factor, and continues to support free trade and, and, uh, and uh, as they call it, win-win cooperation. So I believe that the economy will continue to move in this trend. And whatever politicians declare, sometimes talking to their own propaganda machines, sometimes talking to the conveniently pointed their own cameras, I don't think they will be capable. And I don't think they will be successful by, in a way, putting big trade barriers and trade wars. I talk to people in the White House, and I believe they share also the understanding that the great trade war and protectionist measures should be avoided and will be avoided. And I will expect even a populist leader like the President Trump to avoid such kind of behavior. And on the other side, I would point out that this trade, I would call them small conflicts and wars, which the White House today is initiating, will be more internally politically um, colored uh, than trying to really reshape the global economy in a way to make it restricted and uh, protectionist. So I would hope that this is going to be the case. And I would also hope that sooner or later, political leaders will come on the table not to question those processes, but to regulate them in a proper way. President Rosalia, <laughs> would be very uh, interesting to hear from you, mm -hmm. apart from your feedback that you might have um, from the global perspective, specifically from the perspective of the Latin American region, I would say. We have a luxury of having you today with us. We don't have that many representatives that are speaking during the panel from that region. 
and the conundrum of issues, obviously, that affect the whole region or countries individually related to the issue that we are discussing, including expansion of the activities economically as well, not only of multilateral companies, but actors like China, for example. What do you make of it? How do you see that that reflects not only on the country that you represent, but then on the region as well, if you would? Okay. Uh, thank you, Eka. Um, of course, uh, Latin America is such a big and diverse continent that we can find all the models. Uh, we can find uh, on, the, on Brazil, like a uh, kind of right uh, uh, wing, and uh, in uh, Mexico, uh, a left wing. And also we have the humanitarian crisis of Venezuela that uh, we have to to talk about, and um, of course, uh, all the feelings and all the possibilities are, are, are going on in, in Latin America. Uh, first, I have to agree with the predecessors that uh, talk about the globalization like uh, something that is going on. And they mention uh, two dimensions. Uh, one is the technological, the science, the innovation, that are in our hands, in our kids' hands. And uh, also the economic issues, that even with all these barriers that sometimes uh, happens, but uh, they are going on. The capital is circulating, and um, we know the, the commerce is going on. But I want to add uh, a new, uh, and also an, another aspect that is about environmental issues. Because in the previous panel, um, they were talking about um, uh, a kind of uh, eco skeptical view about what's happening with the world in terms of uh, environmental or sustainable goals and things like that. But uh, even in that field, you feel that globalization is there because if something happens in uh, Europe, it will affect, for example, uh, Latin America of if we do something with the Amazon basin, the biggest basin in the world, it can affect the other part of the world in terms of uh, how is the weather uh, uh, and how it will impact in, uh, in uh, biodiversity and possibilities in other parts of the world. Then we have at least uh, three areas with globalization is very present. The techno, uh, the technological area, the financial area or economic area, and also the environmental. At least we can not also uh, not pay attention wha with what's happening in uh, terms of nations in uh, local issues. Then I always propose in some years ago uh, that uh, maybe globalization can evolve, an evolution of globalization. And, uh, when we need uh, different words for different concepts, uh, the licensing in terms of using of language are done, then we can talk about global issues, not only global issues. And I think that global issues is a kind of evolution of global, because we have to pay attention uh, about the feelings of the people in each country. Each nation has the, the, the right to preserve identity because the local is identity. It has to deal with culture, with uh, gastronomy, with religion, with feelings of the people. That is the identity of people. That is the local. And of course, every, every one of us can say something about uh, his traditions, or Poland, or Bulgaria, or, or, or other countries, or Ecuador, we have to say something. But at the same time, we are uh, with this globalization that is there, and is going to continue there. Then how we can manage and handle the identity of the people with the globalization? Because, uh, of course, in global issues, we can lose part of our identity. And that is the thing that is breaking, and people is feeling that something is happening because we are not respecting the others. 
Uh, respect is a very important uh, word and a very important concept. Then, if we mix the global benefits with all the, in all this area that we mentioned, and we uh, maintain the identity, the, the respect, the local, we can mix, mix global and local and build this that is not so new because it has been uh, during some years, this new word, global, with a new concept about local, how we preserve identities and how we continue with globalization that had made a lot for humanity. We feel here the examples that the pre uh, previous uh, panelists uh, talk about, uh, but I can tell a lot also about Ecuadorian banana arriving to Azerbaijan or Ecuadorian roses being uh, um, in, in places like all Europe or even uh, uh, in other places too. Uh, and how we can uh, manage this with uh, globalization. We were talking about uh, Brexit a few minutes ago and I feel that uh, when we talk about UK, UK was the first globalized country with Queen Victoria's boats going all around the world. Then we feel uh, globalization is going since long time ago and it will continue, but preserve the identity maybe uh, will avoid a lot of uh, uh, friction and a lot of problems. Very interesting remarks, and then we tend to forget that uh, at times we stick with the concept of any given phenomenon in the way that it was for some time without considering that evolution of it is even good, if not <laughs> bad, and, um, and then it's not an end of it, but then the different shape of it that it could take place. With that, I will turn with Benedetto, because it's an interesting um, moment to reflect on deeper causes, perhaps, of of what we talk about today with relation to challenges or the prospects for globalization. You, you work especially in the area which is very local to the people in so many ways. You have your hand on the pulse of how people feel about it. We've heard in different occasions how you know those who felt left, left behind resonate with what globalization brought to them, more of a damage rather than benefit. And Italy is unfortunately a strong example of that, perhaps. We might be wrong on that. So how you would see that, how long-lasting that momentum could be in the societies where there is not yet any firm solution to what the new jobs will be when this new era of the industrialization, but then tech development brings into our world. How this claim of taking back the control of our lives with closer borders, you know, trade uh, rules that are imposed would last because electorate will vote for that. They will demand for that and populists will exploit that. What do you would make out of that? Thank you for the question. I try to be brief, but I don't know if it is a challenge. Uh, so, I like to speak from a city perspective, no? I'm representing uh, an association and a coalition of 158 cities around Europe. They are struggling against discrimination and racism and all the discriminations. So, this topic in the topic of globalization, we are tackling a mix of economic and financial crisis that started in 2008, but the effects are now in this time, and also a faster development in the tech that never happened in the human history. That mix economic and financial crisis, that development so fast in the technologies, mix it bring in the people two possible uh, attitude. The first is the fear, because nothing is like was before. And so the people have uh, feel this fear of the future. If I think uh, from the perspective of my town, that is Bologna, in the north center of Italy, so during the economic, economic crisis years, uh, for the first time, the Bologna families uh, has tackled the issues of unemployment. 
the unemployment rate in Bologna was under 4% before the economic crisis. Now it's come back, is 5.6, it's okay. But during the economic crisis was 10%. 11%. For the first time, the Bologna families, they say, oh my God, maybe my son will be unemployment. That is the first fear. Uh, the other possibility against fear is the courage. Is the idea that globalization, that this technological development is an occasion is a possibility to grow all together. The first globalization in the politics world was, I think, in the modern era, in the 1948, with the UN Declaration of Human Rights. In there, we say there is no difference. We are rich in difference, we are all diverse, but we are human. That was the first globalization. If now, we feel that fear is obvious, that uh, we have the mermaid, that uh, with their sound they say, come back to another world, was 25, 30 years ago, was fantastic. There were prosperity, there were no iPhone. You don't have nostalgia of the phone of your table, with the cable, you have to stay really attached to at your phone, you cannot walk with your phone. I'm nostalgic about that. 20 years ago I was 26. What a fantastic shape I had. That is obvious if I think about. But that is not the solution. But the first solution is in the leadership. If I think 25, 30, 35 years ago, in my continent, in Europe, the leadership that I had, I was trusting in my leaders. I was trusting and I was trust that the leader has trust each other. They didn't treat each other as enemies, also in Europe. And from the perspective of the cities, we are looking at the top level and we demand this kind of sentiment, let me say like this, of feeling, trust in the future. Let me say that this globalization, this iPhone, you know, when the men, the US men, came for the first time, until now the only one, if I remember well, on the moon, the computer, that the NASA had as capability where, uh, so an iPhone is 10 times more powerful than the computer that brought the man to the moon. So each of us have on the ends an, a, an instrument, a tool that can bring us to the moon. And we use it for what? For Facebook? Come on. Facebook is not the new moon. So, leadership, not nostalgia. Nostalgia is naturally, so it's natural, so, you know. But leadership, strong leadership, that are serious, trusting each other, and say, we are all human. The future is only one. The ladies from Ecuador said something about environment. It's really important, and we look who are that are challenging us in this eve, a girl of 16 years old, saying we are threatening our future. They are recalled us, because we had a generation of politicians, of leaders, that put the environmental debt in our time, just to give at our grandfather a prosperity, mm. we have to take all these things together and to trust each other, knowing that building walls in the history had never had the solution. Only the bridge can save us. When there was the globalization, like the, I apologize for the, the discovering of, you, of the America, 
there were the big, big, big caravel that uh, depart from uh, Portugal and Spain and after England and so on. We need big power, big caravel to stay on the wave and take the correct wave of this era. We have to trust in the future, not to be so nostalgic, to be like a grandpa that is thinking of the nephew uh, sitting on the coach and smoking a cigarette that is absolutely unhealthy. I think that is the point. Thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs> It echoes very much in what has been said in geopolitical terms, though, earlier today in the morning at the opening session about fear factor and how that could be tapped into by those who would want to divert, basically, the positive development in the future and how one needs to have courage and leadership to fight against it and then bring that uh, opportunities for the future. I would want to switch with Prime Minister Signora because it's, it's um, very interesting to hear from you how that resonates from where you come from, from the region you come from. We frequently hear about issues related with, the, with parts of the societies that are seeing that they are left behind or have been hampered in terms of their quality of life by globalization with the perspective of the uh, developed countries. Countries uh, in the Western Hemisphere, so to say, who have been the architects in so many ways of the processes related to globalization, supposedly benefited the most, but then at the same time now have this inherent problem from within the uh, political spectrum as well to see the way through it when it comes to the future. But we frequently disregard how that comes at a cost of it or the benefits of it in the region that you come from. So. Apart from anything else that you would want it to touch, if you would um, reflect on that, we would be very grateful. Well, thank you. I'd like to start by quoting a, an ordinary saying that says, there is nothing called a free lunch. And in this respect, I think the world has not been really ready to pay for the price of globalization, and easy communication. In fact, the thing that we have been experiencing is that globalization has smashed all the barriers. I speak about international borders. I speak about barriers of time and place and barriers of visa controls. And not only that, but also the barriers of silence and fear. My dear colleagues, I, I, I would like to say that nature has taught us a very important lesson, which we are not ready to recognize. And that has to do with the birds' flu. The birds fly, cross the borders, don't ask for a visa. And in this, res in this respect, I believe that the world has been really witnessing a new set of paradoxes. As globalization and easy communication makes the world more interconnected, societies are becoming more fragmented. Moreover, tensions between countries and within countries are becoming contagious. And they multiply the bird's flu, spreading turbulences, and confrontations, and ultimately fueling migration, which creates cultural shocks. These cultural shocks eventually feed the ultra-right movements and fuel ultra-nationalism, and this in turn nurtures extremism, xenophobia, and chauvinistic and racist attitudes that backfire and would lead towards more extremism violence, and terrorism. I'd like to really say that what Mr. Farid Zakaria has been saying this, this afternoon, that he touched on one aspect of the consequences of globalization, particularly with nations pursuing more, uh, let's say, uh, uh, productivity and seeing how to deal with, with competition. But in fact, this, in fact, is not really ending uh, with the right consequence, without, 
without really tackling the, uh, uh, the let's say, the, the way how to deal with the bird's flu in its home of origin. And I speak in here is that there are lots of things that are happening, particularly in the problem that really triggered the problem in Europe, which is the Syrian refugees into Europe, which led actually to problems, first of all, in Germany, and ultimately that really triggered the problem in, in, in Britain as well as in the United States. I think that this racist attitudes is really increasing with the increase of the problem of migration. And in this respect, I would like to really say something to you, is that the, the total area of the Arab world constitutes around 10% of the total land uh, on, in, on Earth. And the population in the Arab world constitutes around 6% of the total population in the world. But the total number of refugees in the Arab world, they constitute around 55% of the total number of refugees in the world. This tells actually the extent of the problem that need to be tackled and need to be re resolved. Otherwise, the problem is going to continue. I'm speaking from this aspect of, of let's say, uh, the, the consequences of globalization. However, I would like to really say about my opinion about globalization by quoting what Christine Lagarde has been saying is that the benefits of globalization must either be shared equitably if it is to survive. Otherwise, we will have to really witness lots of problems from that. Un unquestionably, the gap between the rich and the poor countries may have been reduced, but the problem is becoming more widening, actually, in each individual country. We are witnessing this in, in, the, in, in many developing countries, and this has to be addressed if we are going to really solve the problem of, of the negative sides of globalization. I'd like to really say that we are entering practically now a new stage of international global relations where national policies will shape now how globalization will end, will, will actually de de develop. I would like to really say in, in, uh, in conclusion is that globalization is a double-edged sword. It is a boon for the rich, that's correct. But if no proper steps are, made, are taken to mitigate the negative impact on the poor, it could become really problematic. I'd like to quote in here what Kofi Annan said, that globalization is a fact of life. But I believe we have underestimated its fragility. I, have, I hope we can all work and cooperate to make globalization a win-win phenomenon and not a zero-sum game. Very, very strong points related to interconnectedness, not only in terms of opportunities that arise with the globalization, but interconnectedness of the challenges that could be connected with it as well. And then how global indeed we need to be in terms of understanding how we tackle it with a sense of leadership and commitment to it. I would want to turn to President Gurib Fakim. It's a very interesting case of a small nation being so successful in terms of economic development, growth, openness to the world in so many ways. Uh, what are the drawbacks, if any, that globalization could have had or is seen as a challenge that it might have had or could have for, for your nation? Especially I would focus myself on the effects of Brexit, let's say, because it's one of the big trading partners, if I'm not mistaken, for your nation. So being globalized brings these opportunities, but then if any change comes outside to the actors that you are connected so much, 
it makes vulnerable as well the nation that is part of this bigger whole. How you see it uh, from the perspective of your nation, the benefits that globalization brings to the small nations in terms of achieving the growth and economic prosperity, which otherwise could not have been achievable for to the small entities, perhaps, at that scale. But what are the drawbacks as a potential drawbacks that one can have in mind to be more prepared, perhaps, to the challenges that we can face in uncertain world that it might be for some time globally? Um, thank you very much. Um, while I am from a small island developing state, I will also try to be the voice of sub-Saharan Africa in this forum. Um, you've mentioned about uh, globalization. I think that the theme we're talking today is, uh, are we witnessing the end of globalization? I think we all agree that globalization has been beneficial to millions of, uh, of countries, uh, and millions of people in many countries across the world, and has helped pull people out of absolute poverty. Um, in terms, when we talk about a globalization, we tend to think of mobility of people and migration. And uh, I'm proud to say today that I am a product of this migration when my great-grandfathers left the shores of India to come to Mauritius. And I am, of course, the fourth generation Indian out in Mauritius. So that's one aspect of, of globalization. But I think uh, of migration. But I think if we are going to discuss uh, the issue, as we have, we have rightly said, the impact for small island developing states, of course, for the wider African continent, I think we can safely say that uh, globalization as we've known it, I think is gradually morphing into something which, which I would tend to call regionalization. And uh, if we look at uh, uh, what's been happening uh, since uh, 2008, uh, since 2008, we've had the global financial crisis, and we've seen the impact on, on the wider world, especially Africa, and of course, uh, in Asia as well. Now, what uh, globalization, what the financial crisis showed is the impact in terms of job losses, in terms of people losing their homes and all the rest of it. And I think personally to me, that has been a trigger that has helped people come to terms with what globalization really represents in terms of job losses, in terms of, of loss of, well, identity, I'll come to this in a minute. And I think this also coincides with technology, the rise of social media, as we know it. And this morning, people have increasing stress on the fact that technology and the social media have created a flat world where people can see from one place to the other what they can and they cannot benefit, and when they have worked their whole life, what they will never be able to achieve because of rising inequality in the world. And when we talk about climate change, we talk about migration, we tend to see a lot of Africans moving out and moving, and of course we've seen the tragedy in the Mediterranean and all the rest of it. Now, that's, that, is a, that is something that questions us at the level of the continent. We are a continent that has hardly contributed to greenhouse gas. And yet, we are the continent that is going to bear the brunt of climate change. And this morning, when we uh, listened to, uh, to the people talking, we have seen that how do we develop this global sense of solidarity? Because a small country like mine, out in the ocean out there, we will never be able to tackle on our own, for example, rising sea level. We will never be able to tackle on our own, for example, the effect of acidification of the ocean. So we increasingly will resort to a global alliance, sharing of good practices. We will also need to get this notion of global solidarity. And just in the previous panel, we've heard Jeffrey Sachs mention, we are talking about a 2% contribution to global solidarity in terms of $2 trillion out of $100 trillion, which is the global GDP. So we talked about the political goodwill. How do we instill that goodwill? I mean, these are questions that we need to raise. Now, having said this, is globalization or regionalization benefiting the African continent? I mean, this is something, because why I insist on the African continent? Because already we are 1.2 billion people on the continent. By 2050, it will be 2 billion. 
and we have a median age of 18 on the African continent, the youngest continent, the provider of the most the workforce for, 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 for the future. So the, the question that we, we need to be, to be seeing, and uh, because we are talking about uh, uh, you know, migration, we talk about uh, the, the growth of, of the youth and all the rest of it, how can precisely these same tool, which have helped flatten the world, how can they be put into practice to empower the people in Africa, for example? How do they empower, for example, those in Asia? We have seen the massive progress that regionalization, that uh, you know, kind of unification of the sort like countries, for example, like the growing of ASEAN, for example. How these blocks have helped improve the livelihoods of the people. If we look at the African continent, Sub-Saharan Africa, we see that technology is going to empower people to go back to the land, for example, create jobs. How do you prevent the people moving from Africa to Europe, for example? Is to empower them to stay behind. But for them to stay behind, they need to be empowered with the appropriate tools. 60% of the world arable land is in Africa. Africa is set to become the breadbasket of the world if the youth is empowered with the right technology, with the right tools. And energy will be the issue. We talk about renewable energy. How much, if we actually put the necessary technology in Sahara, how much energy can we generate? How much jobs can we create? How can we then make the people you know, be disinclined to leave the continent to go elsewhere? So these are the, the issues that we'd like to, to bring to the table. But one thing that has come up in discussion in the course of the day is the notion that the world is a global supply chain. We are interconnected in ways that we've never experienced before. And this is something that we have to bring to the table, that uh, the issue of nationalism, the issue of jingoism, as we tend to see these days, I don't think it has a place for it in the world right now as we speak, because we are living in a continent that is increasingly interconnected. We are living in a continent that we keep on interdepending on each other. And this, I think, breaks down the notion of A, all the downside of globalism, but at the same time, it's telling us that globalism, I think, is here to stay, but in different forms. Thank you. Very in interesting angle on regionalization as part of globalization, but not as a substitute to that <laughs> when it comes to how they are intertwined or, or complementing each other. And would be, if we have uh, more additional time to, would be good to continue with some of the members of the panel on that as well. In different parts of the world, it can take different uh, pace and different um, nature, so to say. We see in some regions like in Eastern Europe attempts from some nations to become omnipowers in the, in the field of regionalization, either economically or politically, or sometimes attempting with failure on both sides. But then how healthy or how challenging it could be in different parts of the world. That's an interesting factor as well. I would turn to Mr. Licheri at this point. Uh, I don't want to put you on the spot so that you have to speak everything about the EU, for example, when it comes to everything that EU faces. I know that you don't represent EU right now, but you have a lot of experience within the EU. You represent one of the member countries in terms of the political spectrum of the member country, like Italy. Uh, what do you make of everything that is happening now with Europe in the context of globalization, in this looming omnipotent issue of Brexit as well, which nobody finally fully makes the sense of it? Uh, how, how, you would, how would you uh, reflect on all of that? I'm sorry if you are the one that uh, was put on spot right now with, with questions like that, but if you were not intending to spend more time on that, but if you would reflect a bit on that, that would be, I think, very interesting for the audience as well. Everybody's watching with great interest what happens within the EU and with the EU and with, with all of the issues related with Brexit Manageable. and the EU as well. <laughs> <laughs> thank you, thank you, madam. Uh, but sorry, I will speak Italian. Um, ho trovato bellissime le parole del presidente della presidente della signora Gorib Fakim la presidente delle Mauritius and I agree with what you said and I really liked what you said parole di 
the end, I think that uh, this power, that this is about the classification of the power as we see it. And we really live through this very difficult period of time in history, but we shouldn't be afraid of that. This this is an opportunity for us to think about these things because we are we are in the period of big changes and not ordinary but historical changes. Oh, we need to uh, need to make new decisions uh, for the future. So. As you rightly have mentioned, the globalization is about the interrelations, uh, and that thing that uh, it uh, derives from natural natural uh, feelings and strives of people. People want to new new people want to learn about their lifestyles and to see new countries. And uh, globaliz globalization is actually the product of uh, the economic development. And as a result of that, everything is changes, uh, changing, including the economy, including the worldview and culture, etc., etc. So as a result of that, people, people interact uh, more actively the crisis we see in the world, and some people claim that this is the result of globalization, and it has happened due to that. But based uh, on scientific research made, and especially the dynamic research made on that, shows that, uh, that uh, companies uh, companies uh, in their production uh, try to follow standards in their relevant fields and they want to protect also the environment and they want to protect rights of their workers. As a result of that, as a result of, of of this, uh, the, the, we not always see the positive side of that, but we, uh, at the same time, we see different problems emerging. And uh, we see the disbalance. And I think Western countries uh, the, and I think that there is a there is a difference in terms of the um, uh, compatibility of Western countries with other with other countries. So, when we speak about globalization, it it doesn't mean automatically that it's always uh, it's good for all countries. Quite contrary. In many cases. In many cases, uh, only multinational uh, sites are, uh, may win, and in some cases, uh, local industries lose. And I think that uh, that uh, people are not scared of globalization itself. People care about their identities, and they are afraid to lose it. Their local specificities and peculiarities. People are afraid of that. They think that they will fail to manage their future. So, so uh, I think this idea is getting stronger and stronger because uh, they think, people think that uh, governments cannot now uh, manage this, manage these changes anymore. So they try to do something in this field.
end and uh, when uh, and we uh, can say that the reason of the crisis is not the globalization by itself although it sometimes is uh, uh, is uh, it's misunderstood like this so in my view globalization globalization brought a lot of information but we see not so much spread of new ideas because globalization is based on economic development mainly but we have mentioned before that uh, it doesn't mean uh, automatic progress uh, not so many people only minority benefit out of this out of this process so from this from this aspect from this point of view the globalization should serve uh, equality more equality and uh, but some cultural issues uh, are not in the center of attention and sometimes uh, um, the generation of profit, uh, generation is profit, uh, is become became more important than uh, uh, than human themselves. But happily, but happily, we we can uh, utilize some conditions we have in the world because a lot of things is changing nowadays and and using these opportunities I think that we can renew ideas of freedom and equality and we still have time for that but we need to create more opportunities for people and we need to put uh, people in the center of all processes to enable them to find their to find their places uh, in this world and in life we shouldn't fight against globalization we just need to remodel it and to build it based on social social values So uh, countries uh, need to do it uh, through distanciating from big uh, companies uh, and uh, ec uh, diversification of economic life is also must. Only through it uh, we can enforce our economy. And as an answer to your question, I can I can tell we we need to switch uh, to the new paradigm in uh, based on innovation, and we need to enforce the solidarity between people. Thank you very much. Uh, Brexit and EU-related angle seems to be still <laughs> an issue that hard to tackle for many of us. So it's, it's maybe in the, in the Q&A section, if we'll have any time, we could deal with that as well. Mr. Uh, Cicek, um, Turkey is a very strong actor when it comes globally as well in terms of a rising power, but then in the region especially. I come myself from Georgia, and then for us, uh, the role that Turkey has played in terms of interconnectedness of trade, transit of the oil and gas, and then bringing the regional discourse of economic activation of the Black Sea region has been remarkable and then obviously well appreciated and partnerships have grown out of that at multilateral and bilateral level as well. How, how Turkey sees the current times, how Turkey sees that inevitability of the progress in this direction is still unchallenged or you see yourself, perhaps, from the perspective of Turkey as well, that there are challenges that we'll need to take into consideration. 
evvela ev sahibimiz ülkeye bu güzel toplantı için e, teşekkür etmek isterim. Bir iki tespit yapmak istiyorum. Dikkatinize getirmek istediğim husus. Elinizdeki programlara bakarsanız soru tarzında sorulan bir tek bu başlık var. Elinizdeki programlara bakarsanız Should you uh, look onto the, the agenda as we're talking about globalization and that this might be the end of the globalization era and this might be a somewhat pessimistic approach and of course the, this uh, issue includes some sub-issues and I'd like to pause on uh, on, on, on this point at this at this point uh, I'd like to say that globalization of course depends on the region in consideration on the country itself and we see a great deal of difference and in order to fill out the gaps uh, we have to consider everything that we have in common and things that separate us we for example know that uh, there is a country of Azerbaijan whose uh, territory 20% of uh, its territory has been occupied and the citizens of the country have been banished from their uh, native lands and of course their expectations from the process of globalization uh, is different from the expectation of the Palestinian people uh, or the people living in uh, Africa. Uh, of course uh, the uh, and the expectations of all of these foregoing groups of people are very much diff uh, are very different from those of uh, of the citizens of uh, of G20 for example and of course we should take this necessarily into consideration I'd like to to I'd like to speak realistically I'm not going to be overly pessimistic or uh, uh, or optimistic. I think that all over the world people have expectations and so we have the human rights and uh, measures aimed at overcoming poverty implemented all over the world and uh, and possible equal distribution of welfare um, throughout the world but uh, and of course this is inspiring all of us and we've been talking about these uh, things for uh, many years but but the, but the question is how far have we gone into uh, the implementation of uh, of of these particular uh, aspects should we consider the process of globalization positively of course uh, globalization has provided some positive benefits uh, for the world for example when it comes to the issues of uh, clean energy etc we always talk about uh, well at least we can talk about these uh, things we can talk about democracy human rights and other important things and from this uh, standpoint globalization has provided many benefits but on the other hand mm, we, we need to reformat the process of globalization because there are countries that are trying to uh, overly influence the process of globalization and uh, I believe that I believe should we uh, be capable of taking specific pro proper steps we will be able to reach some progress but both on the regional and global level level unfortunately uh, the issues in consideration find no solutions um, this only, only some countries have become global in nature if as for the issue of, if, if you come to the issue of terror for example uh, terrorism has become a problem of the entire uh, humankind. The entire humankind has to fight this this uh, evil. Uh, 
but instead of combating it together, we see uh, that some terrorist organizations are used by some countries as uh, as tools in their political strife, uh, meaning that that terror and terrorism have gone global as well and uh, previous speakers have also touched upon the issue of migration for example uh, which is um, which is an ongoing process in, and we see that uh, I mean, we see everything that's done on the global level through the proxy wars and yes, we do talk about this, but, but what does globalization mean for, uh, specifically for, for, um, for people, for individuals? Uh, will the process of globalization uh, imply finding proper solutions for these problems or not? whether globalization will be able to solve the problem of migration, for example, or not. Here's the question. And, of course, yesterday's solutions are not sufficient to cope with the issues of today. If these... Uh, if, if the past solutions uh, are not efficient, then people start looking for some alternative solutions outside of the legal framework and of course we cannot we cannot view this issue platonically so to say we we need to take into account the entire reality on uh, our regional level as well as globally you asked me about turkey well turkey is trying to do everything that might depend on Turkey, but unfortunately we don't see a similar approach taken by other countries. Uh, we have seen millions and millions of refugees in uh, our neighboring countries, and we do forget about one important point. We have been uh, tackling the issue of terrorism for a long time. And we see the most uneducated people that come from the poorest families become members of terrorist organizations. We have seen this phenomenon uh, in Syria, for example. And nowadays we even have people become terrorists from developed countries. And uh, members of terrorist organizations do cooperate with each other but we don't see the same level of cooperation between the countries that are trying to combat international terrorism and the question you posed of course is very rightful question as to whether or not we're at the end of the globalization era I think foremostly our approach should be realistic and we should cooperate and we should do it sincerely and more transparently. And should this be the case, uh, we will have reached positive results. Otherwise, uh, we will not be capable of, of reaching positive results. We're running out of time when it comes to the full-fledged second round of interventions that we otherwise could have had. But what I would like to do, if the audience will be with us, and then if the speakers still have an energy with them, to have maybe very brief remarks from your side, listening to each other, listening to the questions that I had, what would be your opinion of, of key elements for the solutions, or at least one element that you would think of? Some of it have been mentioned already. Uh, some of it might have been missed. We might not have talked as much on education as we could have, perhaps, in terms of preparing our future generation that we have here with the young leaders as well, together with us, how we think for the future in terms of how we prepare the future generation for an era where human resource will not be the main resource for labor anymore. And then what we do 
uh, in preparation so that they are well skilled for that future, but only have the social infrastructure that enables otherwise for them to have fulfillment in their life, social system of, of ensuring their basic securities as well, in addition to that, and to have an understanding that stability is more of an attainable goal rather than destabilization because of even more deepened inequalities within the societies. One minute, perhaps, or even less, but one remark only. Dr. Ismail is reminding me that we're running out of time. We've run already, but we started a bit late. <laughs> Please, uh, we could go uh, maybe with the opposite order as we started. So, Mr. Chichak, if you would want to comment, or maybe we can start with the flank. If you could, yeah, if you could start and then we go from, from here. So, I already said, so listening, I realize that maybe I appear like uh, uh, only positive uh, man and so on. It's not like that. I, I know that there are a lot of problems, a lot of issues. One of these is the redistribution mm -hmm. of the wealth, of the economic wealth, and uh, how to tackle the big company of the social world, mm -hmm. like Facebook and so on, just to say briefly that in that world, in that global world, there is no democracy. Mm -hmm. And we are not uh, used to tackle this issue. And uh, we can see the embarrassing of uh, the embarrass of the uh, big institution like European Union to have a relation with this big tech company. Mm -hmm. There is only one way for them, is to ask them to pay taxes. Mm -hmm. They cannot, uh, they have an effect that is huge on the young generation, for example. Think not only Facebook, is now is out of order, is out of fashion, is out of everything. But think at Netflix, for example. Mm -hmm. The power that Netflix has to the head and the mind of our youth. So we don't have control. We ask only that to pay taxes. Mm -hmm. There is a predecessor of this way to treat with somebody that you cannot block, but you find an excuse just to kidnap them was Al Capone. That was not kidnapped because it was mafios, but was kidnapped because you don't pay taxes. Please pay taxes. Is this, think about. And the third is leadership, strong leadership to think how to manage. I think that from the youth, it is not just to say I'm playing violin, no, uh, from them. But from the youth, we have to learn because they born with the remote control in the end and the iPhone. We not. We have to learn how to use technology, how to be fast, and they know they are faster than us, absolutely yes, and I'm really confident in them. Thank you. Mr. Chichuk, if you would want to uh, say a word as a final remark. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. I have already expressed my opinion, and I believe that in this area, social media uh, could be um, could play a more active role because uh, because if they only consider the the current situation from the standpoint of their own country's interests. Uh, I think many, many important aspects will be ignored. Therefore, I believe we need to adopt a new approach on behalf of uh, the global countries to these issues. Thank you. Madam President. Thank you. Whenever we talk about uh, innovation, we hardly think of the African continent. And yet the African continent has been leading uh, one very important innovation that has helped empowerment of people, and that has been mobile money. And we've seen the rise of M-Pesa. We've seen how, uh, for example, it has helped those who are unbanked to become unbanked. So it's a very, very powerful uh, tool to leverage in terms of empowerment. And uh, one other thing as well that precisely we've been talking, I just take on what our speakers have said in terms of promoting leadership. But I think over and above leadership, we also have to keep on building strong institutions, which will be led, of course, by strong leaders and I don't want to go into the strong men attitude, but I think strong institutions have to be led by strong leaders. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. My, my final remark will be that there are so many pressing issues on the planet today, there are so many problems we face, but whatever the problem is, 
face any one of them, the only solution to the problems we face today is the global solution. If it's migration, it's global crisis, it's uh, terrorism, whatever it is, the only sustainable and working solution is the all-inclusive, it's the global solution. And either you have the right or the wrong approach how to deliver on that. I think the American president today represents a wrong approach because he says he wants to strike bilateral deals. Imagine for a second, United States and China, the two most powerful countries, come together, willing and synchronizing and coming together in an effort to solve all the problems on the planet. Is it possible? Can just two countries, even the most powerful of the planet, to solve the issues of migration or terrorism or global crisis or the global warming? I don't think it's possible. So because of that, the only working approach, the only sustainable solution is the global solution to the problems we face. And I will be very happy to see leaders, a strong leadership that is addressing the problems, that is building up institutions, that is building up sustainable solutions to the problems we have. And isolationism, protectionism does not represent solution and anyhow, not sustainable solutions to the problem we have today. And of course, there has to be more just, there is distribution. And of course, every country, every citizen is important. And again, the only way to countries for people to succeed is through institutions of order that are synchronized with the institutions of global order. Thank you, very powerful appeal. Mr. Pelkant. Well, President Plevneliev has basically stolen uh, uh, my story. What I wanted to say is that, number one, globalization has brought important benefits to most people and most countries. Number two, we haven't uh, foreseen uh, important uh, negative consequences of globalization. And these two consequences are, number one, that we have more intense migrations, second, more volatile economy, especially the financial part of it. The solution must be international cooperation. Unfortunately, what uh, these negative consequences of uh, globalization bring about is undermining the will and ability to work together. This is probably the biggest danger from globalization. Thank you. Thank you very much. Rosalia? Well, in this uh, vibrant, uh, global new world, <laughs> uh, we have to think that we are living the most uh, disruptive technological world. Mm -hmm. And in this sense, we have to use some tools. Uh, one of the biggest tools is quality of education. And um, in this quality of education, we have to look for the ethical dimension, mm -hmm. because so if we don't put together, for example, science and ethical, uh, it's going to be a crazy world, a crazy world where like science fiction describes us. Uh, in this world of uh, um, artificial intelligence, of uh, all the disruption that we can imagine. Uh, we have to appeal to the human being, and in the human being, we have to discover this ethical dimension. Very, very, very interesting element that was good to emphasize at the end of our discussion. Mr. Signorum? Well, in my opinion, globalization is a fact of life. You cannot really keep the door half opened. Once you open it, it has to stay ajar. There are definitely facts that you cannot reap the benefits of globalization without paying the price of it. And there are certain negative aspects that are economic, political, social, ethical. All these things one has to really consider. And these problems are not restricted to one country. They are global problems, and they need global solutions. Definitely, they need leadership and courage how to handle these issues. 
And when, once I speak about solving the problems, there are certain problems that has to be really solved within each country. But there are aspects that has to be dealt with in solving the problems in the countries of confrontations, where the problems are. And remember always this bird's flu principle that is something that we have to live with. Otherwise, if we don't find the solution, then the problem is going to be accentuated and be become much more acute. So real solutions and political solutions for these problems that are taking place in so many of the developing countries, they have to be dealt with. Otherwise, the problem is going to be much more acute. I believe that we can, if we cooperate, and if we have the proper leadership, we can deal with these problems. Thank you. Side. They della dimensione etica del fenomeno della globalizzazione ho già detto is there a problem? there is a, the translation ok? ok eh, aggiungo solo tre cose la prima è I would like uh, to add uh, three points there. Uh, first of all, we need, to, we need to speak about it more, to discuss these issues more. And at the same time, we need to listen voice of people, voice populi, uh, more voices of people, common people. The other issue is this, we need to uh, we need to put uh, uh, politics politics over economy because because uh, politics uh, when it uh, keeps its meaning can manage the economy and uh, I think the politics need to be under the control of common people. Thank you very much for, for your comment and remarks. Main takeaway that I take myself is that I'm more optimistic rather than pessimistic in leaving this panel discussion. Second is that one cannot fight globalization, well, should not fight globalization, but one needs to shape it with a good sense of leadership and good sense of leadership and responsibility for the future. And I guess that's what we are in agreement with, if I can tell from the discussions that we have. Let's give a round of applause to our great speakers. It's been fascinating for me to be part of this panel. Thank you.